Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. My name is Kate Thompson, and I'm very happy to be with you all here today to worship Jesus Christ together as the body of Christ. So we want to warmly welcome you if you haven't been here before, and if you have, welcome. We're going to start off by a prayer. So if you bow your heads and join me, that'd be great. Father, we thank you from our innermost being that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be born into a fallen race so that by his perfect life and sacrificial death, he might be lifted up on the wooden cross in the same way that Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness so that all who looked would live. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful plan of salvation that you and your grace purposed would be the only way that mankind could be saved from his sin. And so you sent your one and only begotten son, Jesus, the Christ, to be born of a virgin into the human race, God becoming man, so that man might be eternally clothed in the righteous garments of God Almighty. Thank you that by the human life and physical death of our Lord Jesus, he was able to reconcile us back to Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, and to forgive us of our sins, to break the power of death in the lives of all who choose to believe on the mighty name of our great King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and precious Shepherd, our Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you that from his unpretentious beginning, where he had nowhere to lay his head, to his lifelong submission to our Heavenly Father, Yah, Jesus humbled himself, sinless, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. All of this for us, a broken and sinful people, in a fallen world that yearns for his glorious return and eternal reign with his chosen people. Thank you, Father, for the birth of our Redeemer, and we rejoice in the gracious and merciful God of our Savior. And we now join together to pray as Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We've been singing this very special song, and if you feel inclined to stand up, that's fine, but if you don't, that's fine too. Yeah. 
celebrate the advent of joy as our Savior's coming was promised through the prophets long ago. Luke 2, verse 25 through 32 reads, Now there was a man in, Jer in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, So reign, Lord, as you have promised. You may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in sight of all nations, a life for the revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. This is God's word. Amen. Oh, come thou Lord of Jesse free, thine own from Satan's tears. that I loved always, and I'm so delighted when we get to sing this one together. So please, let's all sing from the joy in our heart for the great God and Savior and his precious son, his gift to the world. See you. 
together in his house. Let's sing another one that is just perfect, not only for this season, but for all times. We want to give our God our joy and give him the glory he is due. And we want to praise his name because, friends, he is faithful. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much. We want to adore you today and every day. for you to ask for your favor and blessing on this sermon today. May you bless this message with your wisdom and knowledge, and may you open our ears that we may hear what the Holy Spirit wants for us to hear. May our eyes be opened to your glorious truth. May you convict us by your truth that we would have no hidden sin lurking within our hearts and that we may turn from it, turn away from that sin and repent of anything, anything, Lord, that would keep us away from you by mind or by spirit. May you help us to take your word we are about to hear, to apply it to our lives. Lord, we ask your favor upon Brother Kyle today. Please bless the words of this sermon and the one who speaks them. To you alone be all the honor praise and glory forever and ever in the name of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kate, and Thompson family, and good morning, church. Good morning. At this time, our children can be dismissed for Children's Church. If this is your first time visiting Emmanuel, or maybe it's your first time in a long time, um, welcome. We're so glad that you've Come here this morning and worship with us. Um, if you could take a few minutes, there's some Connect cards uh, located in the pews in front of you if you want to fill one of those out and return them in the uh, offering box in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, we promise we won't bug you, uh, but it just 
gives us an opportunity to know that you are here, uh, learn a little bit about you, perhaps pray for you, and answer any questions you might have about EBC. Um, as a general announcement for everybody, as usual, following the service today, we're going to have coffee and refreshments in Fellowship Hall. Uh, so please join us for that, and that will be followed by uh, Christian Education Hour from 10.30 to 11.30. So our, our own uh, Glenn Nasman will be leading an adult study over here in Fellowship Hall, and then uh, the youth and children will be dismissed to the uh, education building. Okay, Christmas Eve is a week from today, believe it or not. Um, whether that scares you or excites you, it's going to happen one way or another, right? It's coming. Um, but just as a reminder, we won't have our normal uh, Sunday morning service, so next Sunday we will not be meeting at our usual 9 o'clock time, but instead we'll have a Christmas Eve candlelight service at 6 o'clock. Um, so again, in the pews in front of you, there's some invitation cards. If you haven't grabbed one of those already, let's empty those out today, please, and, and let's hand those out to our, our friends, our neighbors, uh, family members, anyone who uh, God has put on your heart to invite to come join us next Sunday night, again, Sunday night at 6 o'clock for a special uh, candlelight service. Um, also, for poinsettias, it's not too late to order those for Christmas. So uh, if you're interested in buying poinsettias uh, in memory of a loved one, please contact Jen Ryan today, if possible, uh, and she could coordinate to get those in time for Christmas. So for any additional announcements, opportunities to gather or serve, um, please refer to the handout that was given to you on your way in this morning, um, or you could visit our website at ebcnorfolk.org. Uh, and finally, one of the many ways that we worship Jesus here at EBC is through our regular generous and joyful giving. And you can do that one of two ways. You could either uh, place a donation in the box in the back of the sanctuary, or you could do that directly online as well on our uh, website. So that's it for announcements for this morning. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Don Ricketts to come up and lead us in prayer. Don? Good morning, church. Let us pray. Almighty, awe-inspiring creator God, rock of ages, the Lord of hosts and king of glory, how wonderful you are in all your ways. Creation cries out in awe of your wisdom, power and might. The universe shines with your splendor, glory and greatness beyond our galaxy. Almighty God, may your name be exalted above all blessings and praise from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name forever. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you and you alone in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Cast us not away from thy presence, O Lord, but renew a right spirit within us. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your patience with us, and thank you for all your abundant supply that is ever before you. Thank you for our country and bless her. Your word urges us in that prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for kings and all who are in high positions and places, that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and goodly and better dignified in every way. So we ask that you would bless the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu, that the people of Boston, especially your people, might thrive in their walk with Christ and proclamation of his gospel. Bless your universal church, the ecclesia of Christ. We give you great praise that you are filling to the ends of the earth, cities, towns and countries with your people. We pray for Derek and Constant Menkele, missionaries with CRU in South Africa. We pray, Lord, that you supply all their needs and that you open doors for the gospel to be preached and believed. We, the people, also pray for the local church around us. Thank you, Lord, that you have called many believers to serve our state 
and region with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask for the fruitful of the fruitfulness of the gospel, witnessing Sanctuary Church in Providence, Rhode Island. Bless their pastor, Andrew Mook, and their leadership with holiness, gospel fidelity, and fruitful kingdom growth. And EBC, be with our church, EBC Lord, as we serve each other in the community. Thank you, Lord, for Emmanuel. Help us as we seek your will in various changes and decisions to be made. Bless us as we anoint, bless us with the anointing and presence of your Holy Spirit that we might know and love you deeply and proclaim the gospel to our friends and neighbors. And bless our finances, Lord, as we give towards you your work and offering. Help us to have joy, help us to have generousness, and help us to give regular. Bless, Lord, those in our community dealing with ongoing health issues or loss. David Turi, Brother Tony Garusa, Dora Davis, Sharon Carloni, the passing of her mom, Lois Wilgerin, Reynolds Lee's, Reynolds Lee's family, the passing of his father, the patriarch, Kun Chao Lee, the Nasman family, the passing of Ruth Nasman, long-standing wife, friend, and partnership. And Lord, we pray for the many other unspoken, silent, unsaid prayer requests that goes on and on, Lord, but you know us by name, and you know our hearts, and you know what we need, and you're a God that's never, never late. You're always on time. So help us, Lord, until you answer our prayers to be patient and wait on the Lord. And lastly, Lord, we now pray for our pastor, our friend, our brother, Pastor Kyle, as he preaches your word. Give him unapologetic boldness and spiritual integrity to proclaim the message of salvation without fear and give us willing hearts to believe all of your good promises. We pray this in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. God bless you. Thank you. Well, what a beautiful morning it has been. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. God bless you. Um, would you please stand with me to read the Gospel of Luke? Brother Don, I think I messed up, but that's all right. <laughs> we'll make it work. All right, Luke chapter 1, and we are in verses 46 through 55. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. You can open your pew Bibles, you can open your own Bibles, or you can look at the screens if you have neither of those options. It says this, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has, hel he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, we thank you that this is God's word, that you have spoken to us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to believe what your spirit says in Jesus' name. Amen. This past month, <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have enjoyed the various festivities that have happened all across our town and state. 
You might have noticed even Norfolk Mass's own Christmas parade on December 3rd. Or maybe perhaps you live in Medfield and you enjoyed that one. Or there's one coming up on December 21st. This isn't a shameless plug. But at Patriot Place, there'll be yet another Christmas parade and celebration. If you've ever been to one of these things, you'll note that normally you march down with other members of your town to some kind of common place where maybe some songs will be sung, the town lights will be lit, and you'll enjoy some cider and some extra cookies because we all need those. It can be quite stunning and very fun. But what's all the fuss about? I got, I've, I've gotten a lot of emails lately. Have you? Black Friday, 50% off, 60% off, Old Navy, American Eagle, Amazon, on and on and on it goes. A global gift-giving phenomena all over the world. But what's all the fuss about? Or maybe you turn on the TV and you notice that there are some channels that run the Christmas story nonstop, 24 hours. You'll shoot your eye out, right? Or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or Frosty the Snowman, Santa's coming to town, all these stations that endlessly repeat, rinse and repeat, from start to end, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, some holiday special. Even some stations on the radio decide that from the day after Thanksgiving up until Christmas Day that they will only play Christmas music. But what's all the fuss about? If you know me, you know that I have three remarkable kids. They're somewhere. I think they're in Sunday school right now. They're 11, 8, and 5. And every time my wife became pregnant, she's thought of some creative way to let me know that she was pregnant. And it was always very fun. It was a great big deal. And if you've ever had a kid, you know what I'm talking about. To get that news that your wife is pregnant and you're going to have a child is a great blessing. But to a certain degree, it's pretty common. True? People get pregnant all the time. People have babies all the time. It's, it's wonderful, yet common. So what's the fuss about Christmas? A surprise pregnancy announced 2,000 years ago. Big whoop. But there it is. That's the fuss. That is what set onto our calendar a day to remember that one person was born that perpetually we celebrate. That whether we realize it or not, or whether it has been lost on us or not, we give gifts in honor of his name because he was the greatest gift giver. And that is the heart of Christmas. The creator is inside the creation, said Hans Wurzma. You might think that a woman's womb couldn't hold the creator of everything visible and invisible, but yet again, there it is. That's what the fuss is all about. The song that we just read in the Bible from Luke chapter 1, you might know it as the Magnificat, if you have a Catholic background, I think, or Episcopalian, you'll have heard of it referred to as this. The Magnificat, taken from the first words of it, my soul will magnify the Lord was written by a teenager, perhaps about 14. Is anyone in here about 14, maybe give or take a year? We got a hand there, we got a hand there. Imagine telling mom and dad that you're pregnant, but don't worry because it's a miracle. An angel told me that the Holy Spirit would come upon me, we'd say, what are you smoking, kid? Get to your room and don't leave until I figure out what to do. Even in our modern world, that is much more maybe sexually liberal, I think a mom and dad of a 14-year-old might be quite upset at this. But here it is. A teenage girl writes a poem 
writes a song about an angelic visit telling her that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the creator of everything visible and invisible, has come. What a miracle. It's a song sung in the heart of a girl about what God has done for her, setting to words what words cannot express. Setting to music what music just can't do justice. That God has come to save us, sinners, and used Mary to do it. I'd imagine that you want a heart that sings. I'd imagine maybe your heart is broken, maybe bitter, maybe just quiet lately. And it's it's forgotten, perhaps, how to celebrate. Well, over the next, actually, three weeks, and um, not including this week, so over the next four weeks, we're going to go through Mary's song. And we're going to talk about a heart that sings, about what it needs to be able to truly rejoice, to have joy. Mary was a a poor girl from nothing. Her name brought her no advantage in life. My name is Degagny. It comes from a a French, I'm French Canadian. It comes from, at some point, someone came from France. That's why they were in Canada as Frenchmen. And if you look back in my lineage long enough, have, has anyone ever done this? Maybe done the online test, the DNA thing, or just got curious? Well, I, I come from a line of farmers. That's my heritage. I'm not royalty. My heritage is not wealthy. It is a very simple, middle-class tradition. I'm sure many of you can relate. Well, Mary was a little different because... Jesus was actually in the line of David, but in spite of this fact, she was poor. And her name in that day brought her no advantage at all. No doubt in Mary's day, there were rich young women that were famous, that were perhaps royalty, educated and successful, held in high esteem, but this was not little Mary. Mary was none of those things. She was nothing noteworthy. Nothing that she had was impressive to the world. No one thought highly of her or paid much attention to her at all. She was simple and she was ordinary. You might feel like you have something in common with the mother of Jesus, if that describes you. She was from a hardworking, lower middle class, blue collar family. That was Mary. She did her chores. She took care of smelly animals, and she did what she was told. Isaiah 11 actually talks a little bit about Mary. Did you know this? It mentions her in the Bible way hundreds and hundreds of years ago, in not so flattering terms either. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. A stump. Thanks, Isaiah. I'm the stump. But from the stump will come a root, a branch, the Savior of man. You see, God can do anything with a stump. And he can do anything with us. Because he is God and we are not. That stump from the generation of King David is little Mary. And the branch, the flower, is Jesus Christ. The line of David and Mary's day was impoverished and forgotten, sort of like a dead tree stump. The priests, rather, in her day and the religious elite held the place of power and wealth and respect. And David really was just a story from the past, part of their heritage. But suddenly, a shoot springs up from what everyone thought was gone and dead. But it wasn't dead because God had made a promise to David that the Messiah, the king, who would reign over the earth forever and ever would come from him. And on this day, the angels announced to Mary that that day had come, that that day had arrived, that that promise was fulfilled because God keeps his promises always. At the last minute, 
When we think he won't, he does. He keeps his promises. The whole world looks up at the rich and at the famous and at the beautiful and at the talented, and we wonder, why doesn't anyone ever notice me? We'll get to that in a moment. God looks down to those who think the whole world, no one pays attention to me. He looks to to those that don't matter, and he tells them that they do matter. God exalts the lowly, and he brings down the mighty. He breaks into pieces things that are whole. He puts broken pieces back together. Do you know that God can put the broken pieces of your life back together? He can forgive your sin. That's what Christmas is all about. That is Advent. Every day, we're after honor, we're after power, we're after applause, we're after attention, and so on. We want to be made much of, and it's never enough. Even when people do make much of us, it's still never enough. We need more. It never is enough. No one fawns over ordinary people. No one is impressed. Little boys wear Superman capes and Patrick Mahomes jerseys. They don't walk around in a plumber's belt. Julian Edelman, you remember him? That miracle catch? Well, he was working very hard one day at Gillette Stadium right down the road. And he was leaving very late. It was about midnight. And he noticed everything was dark. He was heading to his car. And he was passing an office. There was a light on. It was Bill Belichick's office. And he was so astounded that he was still there, busy at work, studying plays at midnight. Well, he walks away sort of astounded that he worked so hard, went back to his car, and then the next day at practice, and he said, hey, I saw you working at midnight, and I just wanted to thank you for how tirelessly that you study and labor. And here was his response. It beats being a plumber. I don't know whether to be impressed or insulted at that statement. It beats being a plumber. We want to be great. We want to be noticed. We want to be excellent. We want the world to see us. But God doesn't, I mean, people often in this world don't see us because all we have is a plumber's belt. We never took advanced calculus. We could barely understand pre-algebra. And here we are, nobodies that God notices, that God looks at, that he is the one who turns his head and sees you. Isn't that great news? And isn't that better than anyone else noticing us? Oh, it would be wonderful if you were a single guy to turn the head of Taylor Swift distract him from, what's his name? There you go. Oh, we want people to know who we are. Great people, wonderful people, yet here we are, ordinary, insignificant, nobodies. Well, you're in good company because God God looks down at the humble and he exalts them. God loves you. He loves you. We look up, but God has a different system. He looks down to the depths of our misery, our anguish, and our needs, and he regards us. And he himself condescends by becoming us, becoming like us, wearing our clothes, taking on that belt himself. God looked down that day, and he sent his son down to share in our ordinary, difficult, and sometimes tragic lives. Isn't that wonderful? To forgive us, to love us, to bless us. And that was Mary. She had a heart that could sing because I think that she understood three things, three things that I noticed from our text. She understood first, God is mighty. Mighty is our God. She said, my soul magnifies, underline magnify, my soul magnifies the Lord. 
My soul makes great the Lord because he is great. I have a soul that has the ability to see. That's what a magnifier does. It makes it big. My soul sees the bigness, the greatness, the immensity, the wonder that is God. My soul magnifies the Lord. It means that she recognized the high place of God, the greatness of God, esteemed him highly, esteemed him above everything else in all creation. More than power, she thought it was he, that God was greater than power, God is greater than romance, God is greater than safety. God is greater than food. God is greater than the affection of a father. God is greater than the affection of a man or a woman or a romance. He's greater than all these things. My soul magnifies the Lord. That means the Lord sits on the throne of my heart and nothing else. The deepest part of her heart was possessed and ruled and filled by the presence of God. She knew who he was. The holiest part of her nature, her soul, that which the Bible describes that lives forever and ever, that makes us distinct from the animals and the trees and all other creation, that which gives us eternity, that magnifies God. The holiest part of her nature was not occupied with whether or not a boy liked her. She was 14, remember. Her heart was not occupied with how much jewelry she had in her jewelry box, how wealthy she was. Her soul magnified none of those things. But the fact that Yahweh, that God, had chosen her in her lowliness was what she rejoiced in. So we we should ask ourselves today, friends, what rules our hearts? What makes our hearts glad? What is great in our soul? You see, an angel had visited Mary and told her some things. You recall this verse earlier in the Gospel of Luke. God sent the angel Gabriel to a virgin pledged to be married. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. I might invite you to put your name in there if you know Jesus Christ, because that's what he's called us to. The angels of heaven come to us. Greetings, church. You are highly favored. Highly favored. The Lord is with you. That's true of us just as it was true for her. That means you are not junk. That means you matter. That means that when you come to him in repentance and faith, that all of your sins are forgiven, you are made whiter than snow, and you are clothed in bridal gowns. Don't be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid, church, because you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants, and his kingdom will never end. Who is this about? Jesus. The pronoun is not you. It's not you, Mary. It's God is bringing Jesus. She wasn't celebrating that she was getting doing something and being honored. She was celebrating that God was being honored that God had fulfilled his promise. This wasn't about her. This was about the mighty maker of heaven and earth and his promise to save. It didn't matter that she was rich or poor. What mattered was that God was with her. Her soul magnified the Lord for what he was doing, and she was simply a servant. Her response, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled to me. Oh, how great is our God. How magnificent he is. Our soul magnifies the Lord because he saves us. That's what makes God so mighty, so great. 
Not just that he created the heavens and the earth and the planets and the stars and the sky. If you read Genesis, I think it's, I've always found it to be quite remarkable that when it, it describes everything that God is making and it, it says, oh yeah, and by the way, he made the stars too. As almost a footnote, but that's not what makes God so great. What makes God so great is that he forgives sinners and he makes us right with him. And not only does he forgive, forgive us, he betrothes himself to us. Oh, our soul magnifies the Lord. What, what, are, what might our souls make great? Maybe good things, earthly things. Maybe we make ourselves out to be great. Perhaps we think that we can earn our way into heaven, or maybe we're not quite as bad as the person sitting next to me. Don't elbow them. But she doesn't believe herself to be great, because she receives this momentous, angelic visit, and she is, impro- she is promised an incredible blessing, but she believes herself to be uniquely undeserving of it all. She's surprised that the angels have appeared to her and gives herself no credit. Well, it makes perfect sense why you would have chosen me, angel, because I'm so great. No, she calls God Savior. In other words, she's not sinless. She's not faultless. She didn't give birth to Christ because she earned it. But she likewise needed to be forgiven of her sin as everyone else. Because she said, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He has saved me too and forgiven me. She believes herself to be uniquely undeserving of it all. And because of that, she is an example to us of the humility that we need in receiving the gift of God and forgiveness provided in Jesus Christ himself. Your hearts won't sing until the most magnificent magnificent thing in them is the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, and it will sing. Mary's had a heart that could sing because she understood that the Lord was mighty, but as we have been saying, she understood that the Lord is Savior. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. The promise of Jesus wasn't to her just simply the promise of a son that she was going to get pregnant because she wanted to have a baby. That's a wonderful thing to want. But she was not celebrating that she was getting pregnant. She was celebrating that she was getting a savior. Consider the great trial. If she was simply celebrating the fact she was pregnant, consider the great trial that would accompany this pregnancy. She was accused of adultery. She almost had her husband leave, or her fiance leave her because of it. They had to go into hiding, if you recall, because of a jealous king that wanted to kill her and her baby. And not only that, if you fast forward time some 33 years, she had to watch her son arrested, tortured, mocked, and murdered. Great things? The Lord has done great things for me? Oh, to have eyes that see eternal life. Because we might question God at times. Has he done great? Really, God, you've done great things for me. Do you know what I'm going through? Do you know what I've lost? And God is gentle with us in our grief. That is true. But can I remind you that whatever you've lost in life, that in Christ, you are promised great things. Great things. Far better than anything that this world can provide. it's only the ability to see salvation and eternal life as a greater gift that would make sacrifice in this life worth it. You see, what we gain is better than what we lose. We sell all our possessions and buy the treasure in the field because the treasure is worth more than all our possessions. 
What does it profit a man, Jesus said, to gain the whole world if he loses his own soul? I think the heart that rejoices, the heart that can sing, recognizes that the Lord has come to save us and that the Lord himself is better than anything that we could have found in this life. So that when we lose things in life, though we grieve, we hope that he is coming. Martin Luther, the great reformer, once illustrated this point. He said a good-looking young boy once approached three young ladies. One he spoke kindly to and gave gifts to and sang to. The second young lady he walks by and simply smiles at. Well, that's nice. But the third he didn't even look at. He took her bread and tore her clothes. How rude. The first young lady, Martin Luther says, represents the kind of person that needs to be lavished with blessing in this life to trust God. That always is proving his love by all the gifts he gives them. They see God as more of a Santa. Give me these things and Why haven't you? And you're upset, right? The second maybe is a little less fickle than the first. All God might give this one is a smile. Small blessing, but blessing. I need a little something from you, God. Make my life a little comfortable. I don't need to be rich or famous, but you need to give me, you need to meet me halfway. The third, however, is content with the Lord, even if he takes everything from us. If he takes our shoes, if he takes our clothes, he takes our health, he takes our our wives, our husbands, our kids, he takes them all and we say, naked came I into this world, naked will I leave, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because the Lord is magnified in my soul. Oh, how I desire to be that third. I usually fit more into the second. I get a little cranky when God doesn't give me the things I want out of life. Rather than, rather than have a heart that rejoices and celebrates and sings. And here is little 14-year-old Mary that would go through hell on earth and watch her son be murdered. And she pens, my soul magnifies the Lord because he's done great things for me. And holy is his name. Oh, how I want that heart to you that he can take anything, no matter what you do. I love you, Lord. I love you. She had a heart that could sing because she understood that the Lord is mighty, that the Lord is Savior, but she also had a heart that could sing because the Lord looked at her. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And that is true of all of us in Christ. All generations for all eternity will call us blessed. Wow, me, I got a double chin. And they'll call me blessed. I don't have a whole lot of money. I got a 2005 Toyota Corolla. And I'm the one that God has done great things for. Not Donald Trump, not the rich, not the wealthy, me and you in Christ because we inherit everything Jesus inherits. We get everything Jesus gets. Our sins are forgiven forever and we're married to God forever. That's what we get. Okay, so I got to have kind of cheap shoes for a little while. Big deal. Right? That is good news. God gives us himself. He looks on us as he looked on Mary. God saw Mary in her humble estate and he sees you in your sadness. He sees you in your depression, in your loss, in your grief, in your sin. He sees you and he calls you anyway. Wow. God looked at Mary and he looks at you and he looks at me and he gives to us his free grace. And he invites us to drink of the waters of eternal life without cost because Jesus paid that cost in full 
she would carry our Lord in her body, an undeserving, lowly sinner, by her own admission. And friends, God promises you the same thing. If you, like Mary, respond in faith, you will carry God in your lowly body, for our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You and I are no different. God makes us the same promise that he made to her, that he will make his home with us if we simply acknowledge, like Mary, that we didn't earn it, that we didn't merit, but that God is mighty and that God is Savior. And we are the kind object of his undeserved and unmerited affection. Isn't that great? He doesn't look on us because we're good. He doesn't look on us because we're wise or talented or beautiful, but because he has overlooked our sin. He looks at us because he loves us in spite of us. He didn't look to the people up there that were impressive because compared to God and his holiness and grandeur and splendor, nobody is. That's the point. If you're rich in this life, you're still not. If you're good in this life, you're still not the holiness of God. If you're powerful in this life, you are not the power of God. You see, all of us are lowly, rich or poor. We all need to come in this humble fashion as Mary, to come to God in faith and look up to the only one that anyone can look up to, and that is God. The focus here isn't on Mary's low condition. This is not about magnifying Mary. It doesn't say my my soul doth, doth magnify Mary. It says my soul doth magnify the Lord. You see, I think sometimes we can be a little hard on Mary because we have maybe a different theology than some of those around us. But Mary was a great example of fidelity and faithfulness. And we should honor her as we should honor other heroes of the faith. You see, friends, we need to be like this little girl. And we need to trust that God has forgiven our sins and to celebrate what he has done for us. You might be waiting for someone to look at you You really want the look of a dad, of a mom. You want the look of a boss or a teacher. You want them to notice you. Well, I got good news for you this morning because someone much better is looking. And I hope that you look back. I hope that you see him and the wonder of his grace and the offer of eternal life. It matters not, once we receive the Lord, what else he might give us in this life. You know, he gives some people five talents and some ten. But the blessing isn't the talents that he gives us in this life. The blessing is him. He is the treasure in the field. He is the pearl of great price. He's the blessing. And he became our lowliness. He became our curse. And consequently, all generations will call us blessed. First Peter chapter 1 says this, They were not serving themselves, but you, you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which angels long to look. The Greek here says that the angels bend their neck to look at the redeemed of God. So not only does God send his look to you that all of the angelic hosts look to you and wonder at what is the majesty and miracle of salvation in Christ. The angels for all eternity will look and wonder at us and not be wondered by by us, but by the miracle of grace found in Christ at the cross. You know, you are called in Scripture his masterpiece. And I hope that you realize that this morning. Come to Christ by grace through faith. Be reconciled to God. 
be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord. This is the advent of Christ. God has become flesh. He himself is humiliated, taking our sin and forever casting it away. Friend, can I ask you, do you believe this? If you don't, would you believe it today? Would you not let anything get in the way of coming to Christ by grace through faith? Cry out to God, save me, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. Remember me. Look to me. Make me right with you so that you might be with me. God, with me forever. If that's you, take your sin to the cross of Christ. He'll forgive everyone and he'll give you a robe of righteousness. I hope that you might share what the Lord might be doing in your heart this morning if you're coming by faith to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Respond like Mary, I am the Lord's servant. God, thank you so much for giving some of us, Lord, hearts that sing. Help us to know and believe this, that you are the magnificent one, that you look to us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can stand with us. We will sing. Thanks, Pastor Kyle. dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word 
or deed. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. You can be dismissed. Amen.